let's start our time in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, um, about, about a week and a half ago, my, my six-year-old boy, Joseph, lost four teeth and the front of his mouth in the span of about five or six days. I actually brought a picture to throw up and you can actually see it. So that, that's, the, that's what happened right there. Now, and so he's holding his hand there to the tooth and, and that night I was putting him to bed and he basically wanted to cash out with the tooth fairy, right? Um, and so he's, he's talking to me and uh, I wrote down what he said because this was gold. He said, Dad, if I see the tooth fairy, I'm going to capture her. I have a knife. I can't wait. Now, being the father that I am, I did a little TSA check on the boy. Sure enough, that long of a knife in his bed. It was plastic, but still a concern. But like, what, what is with boys? I had re heard recently that boys, by the time they're like seven or eight years old, are literally 10 times as likely to use a kitchen utensil as a weapon. Uh, and I've seen this, like kids just be in the kitchen, it's whack, you feel, I'm like, why did you just hit me with a spatula? And the kid's like, it's not a spatula, it's a goblin cleaver. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> well played, my son, well played. But it's like, there's something in them that like they just, they're created for this battle. And if like, if you do not give them a sword, they will make a sword. But what's happening, I think, in our culture is this is getting overly domesticated, tamed way too much to the point where when you grow up, it's almost like you feel like you have to apologize for even being a man. This is in business, it's in politics. I don't know if you saw over in Berkeley a while ago. Uh, the city council in Berkeley voted unanimously to make all language in the city municipal code gender inclusive. And so they removed all masculine stuff. They changed the name of manholes to maintenance holes, okay? Because you don't want to offend women by implying that you can't go in the sewer as well. Uh, and then, <laughs> <clears throat> That's your thing, have at it. Um, but dude, even worse, worse, Hasbro, the toy company, announced about a year and a half ago that Mr. Potato Head is now gender neutral because we don't want to imply that all potatoes are male. It's like, duh. You know, and so, but it's like, w w what's going on? And literally, by the time you get to college, the only time you will ever hear the word masculinity is when it's joined to the word toxic. That is the only time you ever hear it. But my thesis today is this. There is no such thing as toxic masculinity. Because if it were masculine, it wouldn't be toxic. If you take the face off of the mask, off of toxic masculinity, do you know what you have? You have effeminacy. Now, let me define my term here. Effeminacy, I do not man, mean a man who's compassionate or kind or sensitive. It's not effeminacy. By effeminacy, I do not mean femininity. Um, by effeminacy, I do not mean same-sex attractions. I think a lot of guys who experience homosexual attractions have bought into a lie that you are less of a man because of who you're attracted to. But I want you to renounce that right now because uh, our masculinity is not determined by who we're attracted to. Frankly, I wish it were because then I could say, oh, I think women are really pretty. I am really a man. But like, <laughs> unfortunately for me, it doesn't work like that. Your manhood is not determined uh, by who we're attracted to. Our masculinity is gauged by how willing we are to conform ourselves to Jesus Christ crucified. And so if that's not what effeminacy is, then what is effeminacy? We'll pull the definition from Thomas Aquinas. He said, effeminacy is when a man refuses to let go of what is pleasurable in order to do what is arduous and difficult. It is an inordinate attachment to the pleasure that gives us an aversion from what is doing hard and what is difficult. In a word, it's softness. So how do we counteract this softness in, in men? I think, well, I'll give you a couple of verses to chew on. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 15. You all know the, the episode of the cleansing of the temple. When you think of Jesus cleansing the temple, what is the image you see? You see him turning over the tables and the change falling over. The Gospel of John gives a little detail that the synoptics, the other Gospels, omit, which is this, that Jesus making a whip of cords. Well, wait, okay, wait, pause button here. Let's do some Lexio Divina on this. <laughs> I want you to use your imagination. Okay, Jesus making a whip of cords. Where was he when he did this? Let's say 
Maybe he's in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane because he'd gather there with his apostles from time to time. And imagine just sitting there with strips of leather or rope. And he's tying, and the apostle, hey, I wonder what the master's doing. And they go over like, what are you making there? Is that like one of those keychains we did in summer camp? Like, well, what is that there? And he's like, oh, no, no, this, oh, no, I'm, I'm making a whip. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go to church this afternoon. I'm going to hit people and animals. <laughs> like, whoa, okay, well, isn't that like, different than what you were telling us the last couple of months and stuff. But let's put this in context. We got to balance this out. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and men of violence are taking it by force. Every commentary I read on this was unanimous. This is not talking about persecution against the church. This is about people entering forcefully into the kingdom of God by cleansing their own interior temples. He's not talking about an exterior jihad or holy war, but an interior one. And so in order to counteract that which in us is soft, we have to do that which is hard. And so let's leave the theoretical space. I'm going to get extremely specific with guys. First thing, the violence that we need to do, I want you to do violence to your schedule. I want you to disrupt your sleep schedule. And this is going to start at night. Here's the challenge. When you go to bed at night, okay, we get into this habit of social media. The habit becomes a routine. The routine becomes a ritual. The ritual becomes our devotional. It is a false devotional. It needs to be broken. It needs to be killed. The table has to be overturned, which means, and this might be a little tough, no social media while you're lying down, period. If you want social media, fine. While you're standing up, while you're sitting down. When you lie down, no social media, watch what happens. There's room for something else. There's room for prayer. Night prayer, examination of conscience, liturgy of the hours, the hollow prayer app, like just fill it with something good. That's the night, okay? Now the morning, here's a little, ha little life hack. If you use the snooze button, okay, don't use the snooze button. Instead, set your alarm 10 minutes earlier and you will have just bought yourself 20 minutes of morning prayer time while only losing 10 minutes of sleep. Look at that. You're welcome. Right there, it's like a magic trick. This, St. Jose Maria Escriva said that first moment when you wake up, he said it's the heroic minute. And we need to immediately enter in there with a little supernatural thought and go into our day. This is heroically, manfully entering into our day. Because the book of Isaiah says, morning after morning, he opens my ear that I may hear. And from my reading of the New Testament, I'm not a biblical scholar, I'm not Dr. Edward Sree up here, but from me reading the New Testament, it would appear to me that in the Old Testament, the Father gives hundreds of commands. The New Testament, the Father only gives one. There is only one command the Father ever gives in the New Testament, and that's this. This is my beloved Son, listen to Him. It's the only command He gives, listen. Because one word spoken from God to your heart is worth more than 15,000 from me. But if we can carve out that time of morning prayer, do violence to your schedule, it's life-changing. I've been doing this now for several days uh, leading up to this conference, um, and it's, it's been life-changing. Uh, but, but really, let's do this together, really. Like, I've recently killed the snooze button, uh, and, but the, the time that that buys you to enter into your day in the right way. Because I, I, I've got a friend, he wakes up like 4.30 in the morning to start his morning prayers. And I'm like, man, it's like an hour and a half before his wife and his kids get up. And I'm like, yeah, I get up a little early, but like, not that. But let's start to do some violence to the schedule there. Another way I want us to do a little bit of violence, to our senses. St. John Chrysostom said that your five senses are like five entry points to a majestic fortress. And if we do not have a guards at the entry points of the fortress, then the enemy can enter in and take possession of the fortress and infest it. And so I want you to take an inventory of your senses. Do you have a guard over your ears? Or does your playlist need to be taken a whip to? Do we need to scourge and cleanse the playlist on the iPad? Do we have a guard there? A guard over the taste of gluttony, of drinking, over the sense of touch and an inordinate attachment toward that. And here's the big one. Do I have a guardian over my eyes of that what I'm looking at? And this is in specific with the vice of pornography. And I don't have two hours to talk to you, so I'm gonna cut straight with you guys. Here's the deal. You cannot ask a woman on a date or to date you if you are still in the habit of looking at pornography. Because you cannot ask a woman to commit to you if you are not ready to be faithful to her. Because you can either have your pixels or you can have your person, but you may not have both. And this might be hard to hear. And some guys are like, but I haven't looked at it in a week or two weeks, how about now? That's like me thrusting a sword into your gut, pulling it out and be like, the sword is out, okay, you're good, it's out. Well, yeah, but your intestines are on the floor, okay? Like, yeah, it's out, but like healing has to take place. And I'm blunt with you guys on this, and I'm firm with you on this, because 
of a couple of reasons. One, I know not only that you can do this by virtue of your baptism, but you must do this. There is no alternative. We, th our entire vocation is at stake right here. And this, the porn and stuff, it's not even what we want to do. I had read of a guy, and he had struggled with not only porn, masturbation, all that stuff. He was cheating on his wife, going to strip clubs, prostitutes, everything. Finally opened up to another Christian guy. Christian guy said to him, well, hey, you know, if what you really want to do is look at porn and masturbate, then go ahead and do it. <laughs> He's like, what? And the guy said, yeah, no, if what you really want to do is look at porn and masturbate, then go ahead and do it. And the guy got angry, and he pounded the desk and said, no, it's not what I really want to do. And the man smiled at him and he said, exactly. And for him, it was this watershed moment that maybe he wasn't all deprived. Maybe deep down beneath all of his brokenness was this current that ran deeper than his lust, was this craving for authentic sacrificial love. And if we've fallen for the counterfeit, get up. Go to the sacrament of reconciliation. Some of you already been to confession, but did your confession stink? Your confession, hey, Father, forgive me, I did this and this. Poof. What about that? Oh, we don't need to talk about that. You know, that happened a while ago. I'll just kind of hang on to that one. Uh-uh. Well, some guy tried to do that to Padre Pio once. St. Padre Pio read his soul, looked at the man, and said to him, you live near water, but you don't wash. Go. Wash. Don't just go to confession. Have a great confession. Because not only is that stuff not what we want to do, it isn't even well, who we want to be. It isn't even who we are. And here's proof. When I was dating my wife, we were engaged. I remember early on, we go to the shopping mall together. Go to the mall, we walk into a bookstore. I walk in, and I see a little gaggle of adolescent boys surrounding a little pornographic magazine. They're like, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old, and they're all looking at this porn magazine. And I walk in with my wife, and I'm like, honey, okay. And we were just dating at the time. I said, okay, honey, I want you to just walk over there. Don't say anything. I just want you to stand next to them and watch what happens. And she's like, all right. And she just kind of saunters over there, just stands next. This is stunningly gorgeous 20-year-old woman stand next to them and they notice her and they vomited up that porn like the thing was on fire jetted out the door and like hey how about those Cincinnati Bengals yeah they got quite an offensive line this year out the door what did I just witness I mean how on earth did a group of adolescent boys just spontaneously lose interest in half-naked supermodels one thing the presence of authentic femininity it always does the trick. You could imagine if you were at your library late at night studying, and it, you know, you've had a stressful day and you decide to take a little break. You start scrolling through TikTok and you're looking at stuff you shouldn't look at and you know it, but then you can see the corner of your eye, a woman walking, she's gonna pass by you. And that's the girl, you've, you've had your eye on her like all semester, you wanted to meet her, make that first impression, and she's about to walk by and see what's on your phone. How reflexively quick would you just be, like, boom, back to studying pediatric oncology here on my phone. Like, <laughs> What just happened? I'll tell you what happened. Authentic femininity drives out effeminacy. And I was re and this is why it's so important that we draw close to the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as Sister Bethany was talking about. I discovered a saint recently. I've never heard of it before. His name was Saint Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows. And as he was even on his deathbed, he wrote a letter to his brother. And this is what he said to him. Do you want to love? And I ask you men this. Like, do you want to love? A lot of times people, oh, women want love, men want whatever. No, no, no. Men want love, not only to receive it, but to give it. And so he asked, do you want love? Love Mary. People on this earth cannot make you happy. The drama of this world passes quickly. Farewell, dear brother. Do as I have recommended. It is a matter of eternal happiness. And so if you want to love, love Mary, well, why? Archbishop Fulton Sheen answers. He says, Mary is the one whom every man loves when he loves a woman. Whether he knows it or not, she is what every woman wants to be when she looks at herself. She is the woman whom every man marries an ideal when he takes a spouse. She is the secret desire every woman has to be honored and fostered. She is the way every woman wants to command respect and love because of the beauty of her goodness of body and soul. Now, when women hear this, sometimes you can just feel discouraged. Like, look, it's hard enough to live up to the world's expectation of perfect women. Now I've got to, like, compare with the Immaculate Virgin Mary. I mean, I'm not some spotless virgin. I mean, yeah, you know what? Maybe you're not, but I want to tell you, women, like, your value never came from your virginity in the first place. Your sexuality has value because of you. You are the gift, and you still have yourself to give. What we're talking about here of, of holiness, of authentic femininity, it's not about being someone else who's perfect. It's about being perfectly yourself. It's not about being scrunched into some religious little mold. In fact, I had a lunch with a, a, a nun recently. She was a nun, oh, and a doctor, oh, and a surgeon. 
and a colonel in the United States Army. <laughs> I felt like asking her. It's like you didn't want to like be an astronaut too. Like you're like lazy or something. Like, like save some vocations to the rest of us. You know, it's like it's a not about like being jammed into some little box here. No, but what about it? It's about taking that gift of your feminine genius and using it to transform civilization as a whole. Because I think just as desperately as the devil wants to make men effeminate, I think just as desperately the devil wants you to think that in order for you to become powerful, you need to become masculinized. This idea from second and third wave feminism is a massive distraction from the devil. Why is he trying to distract you with masculinity? Because he knows the power of authentic femininity. And if he can get you to focus on anything but that, he is safe. And so what is that power that you have to tap into through these virtues, virtues like modesty? And I know when you hear the word modesty, a lot of women bristle with resentment. And I think for darn good reason, because literally for thousands of years, you women have been blamed for the whole problem of lust. Well, you're the woman caught in adultery. You're the occasion of sin. You were wearing that outfit. I mean, it is kind of the woman's body. It's her fault, right? Thousands of years, the blame has been placed on the woman. But think about it. What is the cause of robbery? Is the cause of robbery the presence of jewelry in the window of the store? Or is the cause of robbery the presence of greed in the heart of the robber? Jewelry does not cause robbery, greed does. In the same respect, the source of lust is not the human body, it's the heart that needs to be redeemed. And so for that reason, sometimes you resent modesty. You've been given too much blame. Another reason I think you resent modesty is because when was the last time you ever heard a talk about modesty that was directed at men? Never. And why is this? It's because we all made a really big mistake of reducing modesty to clothing. And if modesty is nothing but clothing, then a lot of guys figure, okay, what? Well, I put pants on today, like we're good. Like, like, <laughs> like, like, to be honest with you, like I don't even know how to dress immodestly if I wanted to. Like, if I wanted to seduce a woman, what would I even wear? Like a cowboy hat? Like is that, is that, is that like, like no, like fireman? Like no, they're, like, they're laughing at me. It's that hopeless for me. Like, it really is. And so the, the thing is, 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 it's not about an outfit. It's not about reducing it to that. Because what modesty is, is so much more. Because let's be honest, sometimes the immodesty of a man's intentions is far more immodest than anything she might be wearing. And this is not to say that we all oh, agree, I should just be able to dress however we want with no regard for others. How about we start to feel more responsible for each other again? because we've got to step back. And look what modesty ultimately is, women. It's an invitation to contemplation. It's an invitation to order things rightly so that a man knows before he even speaks with you how do you deserve to be treated, that the greatest thing you have to offer the world is not your sexual value, but your personal value. But if you don't understand your, that yourself, how do we convey that to the world? And so the devil wants to get in there and through this confusion and division, split us. Why does he want us so divided? Well, I read a priest and he explained it all. Satan dares to approach only after he has isolated the man from the woman. When they are together, their bond is so profoundly rooted in the image of God that the devil cannot bear it. He isolates them from each other so that he may act. Let's not give him this luxury. Let's do violence interiorly that we need to do. Let's overturn the tables that need to be turned over, order our relationships rightly, because if we can do this as men and women, I think we are performing the greatest form of evangelization on earth, which is to take the invisible love of God and to make it visible by the way that men love women and women love men. God bless you.